Uh, I think this was the first spherical world we did in Ratchet and Clank. Yeah, I think this spherical world uh, 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 designed by Colin Munson. Just a quick thing for people who don't know. Just because the levels are numbered, one, two, three, four, five, doesn't mean we did them in that order. We, we did the levels in whatever order felt right. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. So the fact that the first spherical world is actually the first spherical world is unusual. For a map... Where's my mini nukes? There we go. That bug didn't happen. Uh, what, what bug? There was nothing, nothing went wrong. I don't know what you're talking about. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, in Ratchet 2, you still have to crank the bolt cranks in a circle. Oh, you can't just hold the you direction. You can't just hold the direction, yeah. Uh, I think by Ratchet 3, you just hold the direction. And, and people would often do the circle anyway. So we found, you know, just to make it clearer, uh, we would... Uh, most awesome map ever. All right. Uh... So I gotta get over here. We had a big problem with people having to figure out where to go on this, so that's why we've got like these uh, these cords that kind of show you the way. Well, I mean, the other thing that was very interesting about space combat is we had to totally space rethink combat or, or, uh, spherical worlds. Thank you. Right. Uh, is we had to totally rethink the way we did combat in these in these levels. Yeah. The setups were completely different. Oh, and all the weapons had to be spe specially coded to take advantage of the spherical gravity. Because otherwise they would just shoot straight off into space and not curve yeah. around the, the, the circuit. Uh, let's see, where am I going? I think I'm going over here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we had to figure out how to do, uh, oh, I think probably first jump pad ever in a, or, or fling pad in a right. game, right? Uh, and we had a, uh, we did a lot of, uh, okay, the jump pads. We did a lot of, uh, uh, prototyping to find out what the right size for a spherical world was because if you make them too big you can't see the spherical horizon which ruins uh -huh. uh, you know the, the whole point but if you make them too small uh, you know people get sick uh, and then you know how, how do we how do we tell people where to go like what how do we do a map uh, you know and we had to make it uh, all uh, you know efficient enough so that you could actually zoom out and look at half right. the level so it was it was a huge challenge to do this. Uh, I think coded by Peter Hastings. I Peter think Hastings, did, yeah. yeah. I mean, he did a lot of it and spent a lot of time just making his work. Yep. Peter Hastings now, I think of of Inkling games. Okay. Yeah. Get the exposed rods. I figure I give him a plug. Good. And uh, and Leslie Matheson hook up, also. Hook up your thing. friends. Yeah. Okay, I think we're done with this light now. Uh, so do the lights turn off when you... I mean, how do we know which ones we've done? Uh, I don't know, Mike. Oh, well, no, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, well, uh, good, good, you know, uh, an interesting thing to point out, that <laughs> nowadays I probably would have turned the lights off right. so that you would know where to go. That is a nice touch. I just always thought that was a nice touch. The lights burn you. Don't know why. Okay, there's a thing. This 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 was a, a particularly spherical feeling section, I thought, because digging out the crust lets yes. you let you have a smaller horizon, but a uh, you know the the actual same size play field was very clever. They actually wanted to do spherical worlds in uh, Ratchet and Clank One, uh, they, but uh, they had to cut them because of time. Right. Oh, you know what it is? Oh, you're supposed to actually destroy them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they go away, and the light doesn't show up, and, oh. and so it looks like you got to backtrack a little bit. A little bit. So this is this is uh, uh, this mechanic, by the way, a precursor to. Uh, a very similar mechanic in the uh, Resistance games, the multiplayer of, of Resistance 1, where you have to expose the cores and shoot the, the inside rods, uh, partially inspired by this. And I'm not even joking on that one. It actually was. <laughs> I know, because I made it. Look, I made something good, eventually. <laughs> That's up for debate. Uh, I will punch you in the nuts. <laughs> Anybody who didn't like that aspect of resistance 
feel free to let Mike know that it was, in fact, not. Yes, good. send it to Tony Garcia at uselessopinions.com. Don't worry, Tony, that's not your real I know. email. But you know what? It will be. <laughs> After I'm done with this, you are getting that email address. Uh, yeah, I mean, those you activated three earlier on. I guess you got to go back and do. Yeah. Got to destroy their exposed cores. Uh, okay, so now the lights are turning off, and that, <laughs> that also, makes a lot more sense. <laughs> here's a little a little uh, bit. Every explosion in this game, same explosion. Uh, we modify a lot of different parameters, but it's all based on one single explosion. One Moby. One Moby. Uh, every explosion uses the same explosion, just modified and you know, made to feel a little bit different depending on the situation. But for the most part, everything blows up the same same way. You know, I think we have a, an editable explosion in the Insomniac Museum. Yeah, the explosion. The, the, yeah, the explosion. Then, and you can change the same parameters that the, the programmers could change. One of the few things in Ratchet and Clank that wasn't custom coded every single time. All right, so I got to go that way. Man, um... This is good times. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I don't think I could overstate how much fun I'm having right now. Tony, do you think you could come up with a word for me that indicates? No, I no? words fail. Un unfathomable fun. But then again, I was never a huge fan of. Uh, there were some really cool sphericals in. Uh, uh, you know, I call them sphericals because I'm in the biz. Uh, uh, in uh, in Ratchet Three, uh, yeah, like some of the ones I, I did. I did a uh, uh, did a, a refractor challenge on Spherical World. That was probably the highlight of the game. Well, I mean, it's so hard to do Spherical World because I mean, the the combat has to be toned down a bit because how much can you really see? Well, and we we uh, all of our normal pathfinding methods don't work on Spherical. Right. It was run, run in a straight line. We had to we had to limit the combat to that. So yeah, and most of the spherical world gameplay would basically uh, boil down to traversal and exploration. Yeah, yeah. It just it was kind of a. Uh, I mean, I made fun of it a little bit earlier, but it was it was it was sort of about finding new areas that had new, interesting spherical things to offer. Right. Uh, I, I like to think that the spherical worlds in this game really inspired Mario Galaxy. You just want to keep saying all the things that we even we did first. I just thought maybe I'd include some running jokes, right, uh, so that fans of the series could get behind it. I think that's the really big takeaway from this is that we did it all first. Yes. Everything. Every did. guns. Guns yeah. didn't exist before. I've never seen a gun in a video game. I've never seen a gun. <laughs> like re guns in real life did not exist before Ratchet and Clank. So uh, got what it takes. Uh, oh, the sewer. bikers. Remember the bikers? Sewer levels first. Right. Gun Lava and levels, and snow levels, um, facilities. Okay, so this is something you guys. A little piece of trivia. Um, at Insomniac, we would have some levels that were factories and other levels that were facilities. And the difference between a factory and a facility is a factory is an indoor level, and a facility is an outdoor level that has a water plane <laughs> or a goo plane or something like that. It's a little... Uh, Important distinction. Yes, exactly. 